Wonderful to have you back for another episode, which happens to be our 227th of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And while we're in the sequence here of happenings for reasons, this being volume eight, are traditionally broadcasting from our traditional triangle from three different parts of the world. Uh, of this triangle, we're unfortunately missing our one leg today, who is the Soto Brown back in Honolulu, Hawaii, because you're a little bit under the radar, the Soto, so hopefully, you know, get better for sure. So. Um, Sorry for that. Hope you feel a bit feel better soon. But we have us back uh, in and from Long Beach, California. Our uh, leisure legacy legend Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hello, Martin. How are you? I'm good. Good. Thank you. And I'm Ross Gassin live, as you can see here from uh, a not that known uh, place back in my home country in Germany, which the DE stands for Deutschland. And this is Koblenz. And for that matter, can we get the first slide up, please? Because uh, this is, has been some time travel for me that I was traveling through the uh, center west part of uh, my native country. And this is where my father, who is an age body of yours, Ron, um, um, has uh, his roots. And he, um, having grown up in, 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 in this area, which we talked about briefly at last week's show, now I basically uh, drove up to what he designed for his parents at the relatively young age of in the mid thirties. And I was driving up there. I hadn't been there for a quarter of a century and I bravely drove up to the gate. I rang the doorbell. I said, I am the nephew of the original owner, and I am the son of their son, who is your architect. And to your surprise, Ron, because you were the house, uh, you just shared your memories that you had designed back home in Illinois, the one and only home, you didn't have the initial refreshingly, warmly welcoming response that I had, because they all they said was, oh, come on in. Right. You want to quickly share your experience that was sort of in a similar situation, please? Yeah. Uh, as I, when I was in school, uh, one summer, uh, I wasn't uh, working in Europe, which was the uh, the great opportunities I had uh, while uh, an undergraduate. And I was working in a local architect's office, a very young firm. Uh, and they gave me the primary responsibility of designing the only house I've ever had the opportunity to do. Uh, a little one-story brick house surrounding a courtyard that brought uh, light deep into the home and light and air and the sense of uh, the sky and all the good things that courtyard houses uh, provide intrinsically. So some 50 years after I designed it, I went to the front door and a housewife came and I was holding actually the, uh, a set of the original drawings in blueprint form. And I offered them to her and she offered me to get out of her doorstep and get away. She had no time for me. Uh, so I did not get the welcome opportunity. Later, a second owner, some years, six or seven years after that, uh, invited me in. And I found that unhappily the courtyard, the amount of glass in the central courtyard had been diminished somewhat by some strange uh, wall construction, but the home was so beautifully maintained that that was, that was the good part. So just like life, good and bad. Exactly. So let's do some, uh, you being a peer of my father generationally, let's do some peer review and you share your observations of what I had then sent you about my findings here, going back to the place of my best childhood memories because my parents always then dropped us off at my grandparents and I had the most beautiful summers there with my uh, with my uh, cousins and with my sister and uh, again nothing but the the best memories so some uh, architectural observations from you would be appreciated Ron yeah, I, I really appreciated what I saw in the first uh, first time without you in the picture of course <laughs> and 
uh, it, it's it's the sense of openness in that in that home, uh, open plan, sharing those aspects of Southern California mid-century architecture, uh, including my own home, uh, a half a world away from each other, and uh, also the, the connections between indoors and outdoors. And you had some interesting German words, including fui, that I think you need to explain. Exactly, and that traces back to across culturally to the all American case study house um, attribute and attitude, which again, your uh, colleague, boss and partner at Killingsworth was an inaugural part in. And they all pretty much broke with the uh, with the Victorian attitude of Außen Fui und Innen Fui, which means like the house makes a lot of effort to impress you from the outside. But once you walk through this impressive gesture, you're rather disappointed. And in this tradition of the case study houses, it's more the opposite. You hardly even find the door in some cases, and it looks more austere, to say the least, at least how the common people uh, um, you know, uh, um, experience that. And once you walk through that threshold from the public to the private, you are wowed by, as you said, an open plan, open space, and blurring the indoors and the outdoors, right? And it was, it was interesting that when your uh, characterization is what my father echoed when he was basically responding to the, the pictures I sent him, he said, oh, it almost looks American. And, and that seems like an, an, uh, a retrospective characterization that he didn't seem to have at least consciously, maybe subconsciously, because you know all the architects were very, very impressed and looked up to you guys in America and the case study houses. So this is a late admitting, attributing to that one, right? Yes, and I get to have uh, an added bonus of my own home because I have some two-story spaces that uh, actually look into each other. And uh, what is really a small house, little more than 1,200 square feet, suddenly seem so much larger because you're, you're looking up at rooms above you. Uh, the sunshine is flowing in through two-story glass walls. Uh, yeah, of a, a fine sanctuary. Yeah, and that's the same here. Similarity, amazing similarities. The uh, the uh, now owner is actually the only the second owner, so he bought it directly from my grandparents uh, after they lived there for you know a little more than than a decade only uh, because they couldn't talking about the lot. The lot is rather large and it's almost like uh, uh, ten times as much as the house. And this only has sixteen hundred uh, you know uh, square feet, and yours has twelve hundred. So it's kind of the same. It's in the same. It's a little larger. But both uh, feel much larger. And the now and only second owner told me when he first approached the house, which you see on that uh, top, uh, the second from the top, uh, that show quote, you see myself and my lady cousins and my sister having fun in front of the house. And the house looks very, as we said, in the tradition of the case study house, is very nondescript. And he said when he saw it, he, he, he it came across to him like a barrack and he was about to uh, turn around and drive away and not being interested anymore. Luckily, he was uh, not doing that and, and, and walked inside and saw what you see on the, on the bottom picture, that sort of large sort of living landscape, as you can call it, with a fireplace as the main archetypical anchor in the center. And then all the beam structures basically, you know, spreading out from there like an umbrella. So you can almost call it Tropical Rockwood had, had, has a project that he calls the Umbrella House. This, of course, you know, has to be heavily walled um, outside because, again, we're talking temperate climate here. We're not talking California. We're talking about Illinois. So here we go with the, with the analogies. Um, we want to make a little side reference to us soon uh, reconvening our ongoing series of comparing automobiles to architecture, because that yellow car you see up there is what 
made my grandfather to be the coolest grandpa around because usually grandpas drive more grandpa -y cars, but he didn't. He uh, spoiled himself after retiring as an officer from the Bundeswehr, the German army, with his very, very hot uh, BMW E9 uh, from that same era. And uh, he uh, strategically uh, choose this very bright fluorescent yellow uh, color, and I will never forget that. And I once, you know, there was a surreal situation on one, one of my many flights back from back from the heartland when it was still in the in, in Nebraska in in the prairie where you're from. Um, I was browsing through an automotive magazine that the airline happened to you know hand out, and. Um, the guy next to me, I started to engage me in a discussion and he said, this is my car. And I said, no, this looks like my grandpa's car. And it turned out to be that he bought it from my grandpa. Isn't that surreal? Uh -huh. It happened to be us in a plane half around the world opening in a magazine, which was like a uh, vintage car magazine, right? So totally, totally surreal story. Anyways, yeah, talking uh, house and landscape, uh, interior-wise and open plan and floating and flowing spaces. This house uh, is privileged to be as the um, as the Google image at the very top right shows to be uh, fronting a forest directly, and so there's a lot of greenery around it. And also, the house is now uh, barely noticeable from its barrack. Uh, front uh, appearance because it's all heavily uh, uh, vegetated. And that gets us actually back to your home with uh, sort of retrospectively, unfortunately, but fortunately also survived, uh, you won't believe it, another water, uh, um, uh, not a water incidence, but an incidence of another um, in, in intrusion into your into your into your uh, into your world into your domestic world, Ron, and that gets us to the next slide. And then talking cars, right? Maybe we take the car as to segue into this one here, because uh, this story is around uh, a smart car, right? And smart cars are these German cars that um, basically have been invented by the Swiss guys who have invented the Swatch watch and Mercedes-Benz. And they wanted to, just like with a watch, bring, uh, make cars accessible to most people, to all people, also to people who couldn't or didn't want to uh, basically uh, buy big cars. But the reason, the, I think uh, the car parking, which is not yours because you are a fan of German cars, uh, which we will get to later in the car shows, but currently you have your Audi A4 that you talking water incidents, your water pump broke, right? So this is never ending. Hopefully it's ended now. Happy new year, different year. <laughs> Water damages are over, period, right? So just now I'm thinking this is another addition to water pump damage you had, but now your Audi is, is back. And so here, uh, this is not your Tacoma, but Americans basically used to refuse small cars because they said, um, I'm too endangered in a small car. But share your memories that you had once seen the, the substance of a smart car that, that amazed you, right? I seriously considered uh, buying uh, a smart car. Um, and when I went to the dealer on display, they had just the frame of the car up on display. And this uh, definitely small car was incredibly reinforced uh, with its steel frame. And I'm willing to bet from just my memories of that, was that that car was probably even safer than larger cars, because uh, the German engineers had really considered uh, the, the car and the passengers holding up in case of an accident. And I think it was the, almost the most rollover proof car as far as damage to passengers that I've ever seen. There you go. But, but that being said, that Americans bought it. And as you found out the hard way, it's uh, well, it is it is so um, safe and sound and bullet like that it caused another intrusion on your <laughs> on your escapes. Right. Report about that. Yeah. Uh, 
the, the, the pictures at the top, uh, top left and top right, show uh, the fact that, that uh, my home is, is really lost in the greenery. I'm fronting, as it shows on the upper left, a beautifully manicured hillside held up by a, uh, a concrete wall that in itself is beautifully manicured with ground ivy. And then the, to the right is my own home entry, which is merely lost in ferns and vines and, and uh, tropical, uh, tropical like uh, bamboo. Uh, and I, I had been so proud of my house, of course, and then lost it for three or four months when I had a pipe burst and I had water damage. The same week that my old furniture and furnishings and my precious books and things were coming back to the home and I was distributing them and finding myself again in familiar surroundings, a woman in a smart car uh, swerved to avoid uh, a head-on collision with another neighbor, apparently, and ended up driving her little smart car diagonally right through my gardens, which I had been so proud of. What was the loss? Uh, 30 years of tending uh, a grove, that's probably the wrong term, uh, but I'll say a grove of roses that I had really uh, uh, loved and cared for. They were gone. They were torn out. And almost all of the bushes parallel to the street were gone, jet flowering jasmine. Uh, and after the trauma of the house damage repair and what it takes to get through that, all of a sudden, my front garden was also something uh, I could not be proud of anymore. There's an old saying about that uh, for those who, who find themselves behind the eight ball, infamy, infamy, God's got it in for me. But the lesson I learned from the home is just jump into it, take it day by day and get it done. In this case, uh, the woman driver was so embarrassed and we were so glad that obviously that she wasn't injured at all. Uh, and I, I got an estimate from a gardening company uh, as to what it would take to have them replace it. I gave her the check, and a day later she gave me a check. The replanting's done. It'll take some time before the home will look as, as good as it did before, but it will in a year's time. And uh, again, when, think these kind of travails, uh, when they don't kill you, make you stronger. <laughs> So true, as that's what they say, and you proved it. But still, we felt for you, Ron, in this time, and we thought, uh, couldn't we just make you leave all this misery, hop on a plane, get back to your Hawaii, our Hawaii, and uh, relax a little bit? And so, obviously, you know, we would have liked to have you stay with us, which we get to later. But uh, next slide gets us back to hospitality. Um, design and the appreciation of it and uh, the recent ranking that we had shared at the beginning of this show uh, sequence here where of this magazine um, that you will remind us of now um, you were scoring the top poll positions with your projects but now we want to revisit a little bit further down the ranking, which is uh, somehow very interesting as well, because these are more kind of small scale, more kind of more humble, less corporate um, kind of um, also um, existing hotels that have been remodeled. And number six is the Kaimana Beach Hotel that we, with a show quote at the top left, already were uh, visiting uh, when we heard about its renovation recently. And we were a little bit um, disappointed because its substance, uh, it's from the mid-century, so its substance is talking courtyards, Ron. It has a courtyard, and so it has single loaded corridors around the courtyard. So we were actually wishing it would take more advantage of that and uh, apply more easy breeziness, as we like to call it. But what we saw in the images of the hotel uh, room interiors is very much alike of you had been elaborating a lot, rightly so, about what had happened to the hotel rooms of your Hali Kalani, right? Is that fair to yes. say? So um, we weren't so fond of that. 
uh, that I think we should take a chance. Uh, DeSoto had been updating us on the Halikolani and gone there recently with France to eat. And he showed you some pictures that weren't uh, very much um, helping our otherwise optimism to keep uh, the uh, common spaces intact and unchanged, right? You want to share that a little bit? What your feelings about what you saw? Yes, uh, just several recently uh, with friends, went back to the Holly Klein and had a, a very fine and memorable meal. He, he sent me a few shots of the original lobby, which is furnished with the only working fireplace in all of Waikiki, which has been there ever since C.W. Dickey designed the Lures house. The lobby space, I, I, I hardly recognize it from what my interior designer did when we took it over and uh, uh, and re renovated the building. The, the owner, a uh, Japanese gentleman who happened to be a Francophile, had purchased himself with his own money a very strange and, and, and eerie painting called After the Ball. Uh, it, it hung in a prominent position right above the fireplace. And uh, it was gone. And in its place was, uh, was something that I would not. Uh, even use the word art to describe. Uh, and the furniture itself was also uh, rather stiffly arranged in the room and not so, not so casually placed uh, so that it looked you know, comfortably lived in. It was just an, an example again of someone thinking that something has to change uh, and why, I don't know. Yeah. And probably people can call us really uh, subjective and biased, right? Because you're the creator. And uh, again, I was introduced by our exotic escapism expert, Susanna, to your place that we fell in love with and with each other. And so, uh, you know, we're highly biased, right? And the origination of that painting, you guys just go back to the shows with you, Ron, that you described this uh, very elegantly and eloquently. But I, I don't think we want to come across as just being grumpy uh, Statler and Waldorf as the Muppet Show figures up on the gallery there, right? And just oh. ranting. <laughs> because, um, for example, I, I got you very excited about the artwork of Kaili Chun. So um, I, I can see you, Ron, uh, when they would have replaced that picture maybe for a little while with an artwork of Kaili that tried to really engage with the history of the place and, um, and its projection, I'm sure you would have been fine with that. And, and as you said, only if you replace things that have are there for a really good reason and you switch them out and you replace them with something worse, then there is a problem, right? Yeah, the, the, the painting uh, was eccentric, yes, uh, but extremely interesting. And the, the idea behind the lobby in, in, in the original renovation that I and my interior architect took on was that in some respects, it would be something like uh, still furnished as it was in the 30s, uh, almost a kind of maiden ant aspect to it. Nothing stiff, uh, nothing particularly modern, but something harking back to those glorious times back in the 30s when the Lures House was still built. And eccentric, memorable things, I think, should remain to be eccentric and memorable for a guest experience of any hotel. Yeah, indeed. And the proof of evidence that you're open to these things is actually the other rankings here. One is the Surf Jack Hotel, which is ranks comes in at, at number eight. And that's a hotel that's uh, mid-century and it's been uh, updated and refreshed, not to its origin, but interpretively very, and uh, there were some several Docomomo events in there. And speaking of these, when we had you as our keynote speaker at the National Symposium, we basically set you up in another retrofitting of a hotel, and that is the Lalo. And uh, it's lobby we see at the very top right. And uh, explain us about that, your experience in that one, Ron. You know, what a, a great stay at a hotel that I had not heard of. It had been renovated. Uh, the lobby experience 
was open uh, to the air uh, on all sides, easy breezy, with a restaurant attached to it, which also provided some outdoor dining space. And they took it upon themselves to use some aspects of Hawaiian kitsch. I'm talking about uh, surfboards and Hawaiian shirts. And in the rooms, there was large, uh, large leaf bamboo wallpaper that was obviously harking back. It all, almost reminded me of uh, uh, the ho hotels in Los Angeles that made such giant flower wallpapers famous. And from my room, I had a, a, a great a full view of the Pink Palace. I couldn't have felt more in Honolulu uh, historically than that and, and had a very enjoyable stay and suggest that people consider that if they're bringing friends from out of state uh, for a stay. The Lalo uh, got its honor uh, in a little lower down the list for good reasons. Yeah. And again, we, we feel bad. We should have put you up in your hotel, the Halikolani, but due to its <laughs> price range, that was uh, not possible, right? So we're talking about more budget hotels here, right? So, and the the building of where the Lelo is in is, is uh, a rather average, I think that's fair to say, mid-century modern building, good in its bones and orientation is right, Malcolm Mackay and it has Lanai's, right? But architecturally, it's not one of the most prolific ones. But really, the the, the touch up, the renovation really imp improved it. And there's there's a big, large um, outdoor uh, restaurant area open to the sky right next to this lobby where when Suzanne was over last time, we we really had a good time. So so that's improvement, and it just proves that you're not basically stuck in nostalgia and you're basically not open to evolution. No, you just prove that you're, that you're welcoming sort of uh, contemporary interpretations of a tropical exotic as again, exemplified here in the lobby that we see with the breeze block screen that has the pool behind and uh, rather outdoorsy furniture and the very jungly vegetation in there. So we're at the end of our exciting 28 minutes and with that image at the bottom right is basically giving us a clue where we're going next because we're ongoing uh, uh, sharing our water damages. And that will happen in what you see in here, which I'm a little jealous now that we didn't uh, show up on the ranking here because it's my home back on the island in the Waikiki Grand Hotel which has been featured here in the prestigious Monocle Travel Guide series. And this is from their promotional video. And it was uh, incorporated and featured there because of its vintage uh, signage in there. But what happened in that building as my contribution to the water damage series, you have to wait until next week. And until then, uh, stay all healthy, first of all, and DeSoto in particular. Uh, and happy, and please stay uh, vintagely tropical exotic as you rock. And See you next dry. week. And dry, yeah. <laughs> See you next week. Bye bye.